The Lord be with you. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, and we have an opportunity to be thinking about the way that Jesus teaches, and I'll get into that uh, um, during the sermon uh, this morning. So we don't have any birthdays or announcements of which we know except for one. I believe that Alvin Walter's daughter, is Bev here? Bev Fairburn, you have a birthday. Oh, <laughs> well, it just so happens we never ask people's ages because that's who we are. That's just the way we like it. But we do sing happy birthday. So let's sing happy birthday to Bev. So Bev, I lied. Um, we do ask you to tell us your birthday, but not in years, in seconds. Go ahead. I guess that's not gonna work, okay. So let's take a moment to greet each other in the Lord's name. Take a moment to um, look at the camera if you're comfortable with that, and then we'll begin our service. This is our gospel music worship service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We join together in our opening song. may be seated. Let us humble ourselves before God, confess our sins to him, and ask his gracious forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. We now confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and before one another that we are sinful human beings 
by nature and by deed. We have not always put God first. We have used his holy names in ways that do not honor him. We have not always been devoted to the Lord and have not fully cherished the sacred writings of our faith. We have failed in ways of keeping our thoughts, words, and deeds pure and honorable. At times, we have taken what is not ours and have spoken that which is not helpful or true. We have broken the law of God by coveting that which is not rightfully ours and have not put the best construction on all things and spoken the best of all people. We pray our God to have mercy on us, to forgive us all our sins, and to bring us to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grants us pardon and peace and forgiveness and remission of all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing the song of praise. Congregation may be seated. <clears throat> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your church in your perpetual mercy. And because without you we cannot but fall, Preserve us from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. The Old Testament reading is from Amos chapter 8. Hear this, you who trample on the needy, and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may take the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, 
Surely I will never forget any of your of their deeds. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of the truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all preservation, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn an account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning up his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons and daughters of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons and daughters of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join together in the sermon song.
Grace, mercy, and God's peace be unto you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. The text is the gospel. Please be seated. This saying is true. For what is exalted among people is an abomination in the sight of God. So Jesus, in this gospel account, is telling this parable's to his disciples, but very consciously in, within earshot of the Pharisees, who according to Luke, happened to be lovers of money for all the wrong reasons. So he begins. There was a certain rich man who had a money manager who was sitting on his assets wasting his possessions, and just generally speaking, not doing his job. And so the rich man calls him in, demands to see the books, and fires him on the spot. On his way back to the office to retrieve the books, the manager happens to do a little bit of creative accounting on his own and realizes he has a problem. When the word gets out that he's been fired, no one is ever going to hire him as a manager, and he's too out of shape from sitting at a desk to dig, and he's too proud to beg. So, what do you do? He devises a clever little plan, of course. Before anyone hears about his being fired, the manager goes to some of the rich man's tenants, possibly deadbeat tenants, who weren't paying their rent anyway, and begins to discount their bills. One owes a hundred measures of oil. He says, quick, take your bill and write 50. Another owns a hundred measures of wheat and he says, write 80. Two possibilities exist. Either the manager is giving up his cut or he's discounting his former master's contracts. In either way, either case, he's making friends on borrowed time because as soon as the word gets out that he's been fired, all bets are off. And the master or the Lord, you can't really tell here, commends, and yes, the word is commends, this manager for his shrewdness. And then Jesus makes an observation that I wish in the church we would heed. Jesus notes that the sons and daughters of this world are a heck of a lot more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons and daughters of light. In other words, believers or citizens of the kingdom. Now what makes the manager shrewd is that he rightly assesses the urgency of the situation and he acts on it, cashing in on his master's name and reputation while there was still time. So that when he was unemployed, he wouldn't wind up sleeping in the streets since now he had some new friends. And so Jesus says, use your unrighteous mammon to gain eternal friends so that when it fails, you aren't left behind. And it will ultimately and eventually fail. You will have lots of eternal friends who will welcome you into eternal dwellings. Now please don't misunderstand what I just said. This is not to say that you get into heaven by giving away your money. Though your money as idolatrous mammon can most certainly keep you out of heaven. What it means is that you are not masters of your money and servants of the Lord. For you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon. One has to give. It always does. 
This gets to the principal reason behind the idea of our offerings. We try to make it practical by looking at budgets and expenses, needs, assets, liabilities. But you know what? None of those things are really the point. Those are the temporal things, which are important, but only in a temporal kind of way. You know what the chief purpose of our offerings are? To loosen our grip on our money, lest it become mammon and idol in our hands. In other words, the way to prevent wealth from becoming an idol is to give it away. To show it in essentially and in reality who the boss is. To order it around. Tell it to help tell it to help the poor person or feed that hungry man or woman. It means that we use wealth that we have not in view of this life, but in view of the eternal life that is ours in Christ. Wealth will fail, just as our health will fail, and in the end, our life will fail. Inevitably, inexorably. And you know what? I don't need to remind you to just look around to the economic times in which we live right today. Money, investments, pension funds are not the place to put your faith, hope, and trust. These will fail and will drag you down with them. Only the word of the Lord endures forever. Now please don't under misunderstand what I just said there. You still have to be a wise manager and plan for the future. But the treasure that endures is the treasure of heaven, not of this world. And so we handle the wealth of this world as citizens of heaven, who deal in eternal currency, whose value is determined by the Son of God, who loved you and me and shed his blood to save us. Faithfulness in little means faithfulness in much. Faithfulness in things temporal reflects faithfulness in things eternal. If you haven't been a faithful steward of something as incredibly fleeting as money, why should God entrust you with eternal treasures? And the answer is, he shouldn't. The reality is that our hearts are divided and we indeed try to serve two masters, hoping they don't ever recognize each other. We put in our God like sorry, we put in our God time like the Israelites of Amos' day, and then it's back to usual. The Old Testament reading, which is paired with this gospel account, has the Amos blasting away at the Israelite businessmen of the north for not being able to stay away from the business deals long enough to worship and reminding them that the Lord won't forget either their greed or their crooked dealings. Where we love God, sorry, where we love wealth, Jesus loved God. Where we pursue comfort, he went directly to the cross. Where we look for profit and gain, Jesus takes loss. Where we gladly bow down to the devil, for a little more than a sampling of this world's riches, Jesus renounces this world's riches and worships God. Where we are faithless in little, he is faithful in much. Let me explain the, or bring into light now, the epistle you heard this morning. How do you stand against all these things 
that come flying at you. Paul, sitting there in prison, writes to the Ephesian church, probably even chained to a big burly Roman guard. Because he says, I'm an ambassador in chains. And Paul was an educated man. Remember, he was brought up as a Jew and knew the law backwards, probably better than the Pharisees. He happened to be a Roman citizen, which gave him free access to the entire world. He didn't need to present papers to travel anywhere. And he was a persecutor of Christians until he had his Damascus Road experience. And so there he is in prison, chained to Paul, or to, to a Roman si a soldier. And he's trying to tell the people in the church in Ephesus that they need to remember to keep their eyes on Jesus. And also in another book, but he tells them, look, put upon yourselves the armor of God. It's the same way that we talk about putting on the righteousness of Christ after we're baptized. We put off, we mortify the old sinful self and the new robes of righteousness are ours in Christ by virtue of our baptism. And so he starts comparing the Roman armor to the world. And he starts by saying, hold the shield of faith which will protect you from the flaming darts of the evil one. The Romans, one of their battle gear items is flaming darts. They would dip the arrows into oil and then light them and then f um, fire them at the opposing armies. But pretty soon opposing armies learned that and did it back to the Roman soldiers. But if you have a shield of metal, that's good. If you have a shield of wood, that's bad. So they had shields of leather. What did they do with the leather? They soaked the leather, leather in water. And so when the flaming darts of the enemy came, the dart would go into the leather and extinguish. That's your shield of faith. It's not by your own strength. Even the Roman soldiers realized they needed something external from themselves to protect them. And so they put on the armor of, uh, that they wore. And Paul tells us the same thing. Don't ever rely on your own strength of faith because there are going to be times in life where your faith will be filled with doubt. So put on the armor of God, the shield. Wear the, the breastplate of faith. Wear the helmet of salvation. And then there's a laundry list of items to put on and God gives us all those things. And he gives you those things. So I invite you to read that passage again and find the list and remember those things. So where we exalt power and wealth and fame, God exalts in Christ righteousness and faithfulness and love. What is exalted among people is despised by God. As it is conversely true as well, what is exalted by God is despised by people. Remember, everything in the kingdom is the exact opposite of the way the world is. Jesus, crucified, risen, and reigning at the Father's right hand, highly exalted in the sight of God, yet despised and ridiculed in the sight of people. That a sinner, and every Sunday I use that word, because it involves preaching Christ and him crucified. And that's what we do, because every last one of us is a sinner. A sinner is made right before God, justified, not by who she or he is, or by what she or he does, 
but solely in trust in Jesus, who is the Savior, and because of what he has done. This is, a, is despised by people and esteemed by God. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. Here's where it affects you in your life every day. You are baptized in Jesus. His life is yours. His faithfulness is your faithfulness. His kingdom is your kingdom. You literally have nothing to lose. Even if you die as a beggar like Lazarus, which, by the way, is the parable that comes after this one. Now, what does it mean that you have nothing to lose? It means this. Being dead to this world and dead to yourself turns out to be the freest position there is. Look at the parable again. Notice that only when the manager has lost his job and has nothing to lose, does he actually do his job. Had he been that aggressive with his master's money all along, he would not have been fired in the first place. It's like the parable of the man in the ditch and the good Samaritan. Only the person who is free from the law can actually do the law. Only as you are free from your wealth and hold it freely in a dead hand of faith can you actually master it as you serve God. My friends in Christ, you are that free person baptized as a child of God. In Christ, you have the riches of heaven laid up in trust for you. In Christ, you have an eternal dwelling that is to come and awaits you. In Christ, you hold citizenship not in this world or, a, or of any country, but you hold citizenship in a country that will never fall. In Christ, you are a servant of the true king, the one who gave his life for all and who is the master of your money too. My friends in Christ, this calls for shrewdness, the shrewdness of faith that cashes in on the good name of Jesus and lives as though you have nothing to lose. Because you don't. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Please stand as we join together in singing the song of response.
congregation may be seated. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, God, My friends in Christ, this morning we're going to remember again the people of Weldon and the James Smith Cree Nation. We'll also be praying for the people in Ukraine and for those who are mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth. In our prayers next week, and there's a bit of a, um, a progression here, in our prayers next week, we will include a prayer for the new King Charles III. And that's how that progression will occur. We're also praying for a number of people who are now newly admitted into the hospital. So Larry Mickelchuk's mother, Joyce, is in the hospital. And Margaret Mickelchuk, Larry's wife, her mother, Elsa Schmeling, is in the hospital as well. And so we'll remember all of them in our prayers this morning. My friends in Christ, the Apostle Paul instructs us, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high places and positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Rejoicing in Christ's salvation offered to all, let us call upon God our Father for ourselves and for all people. Kind Father, your Son declared to us that we cannot serve you and also be devoted to money. Free all your baptized children from obsession with the goods of this world that they may set their hearts on the joys of the kingdom and the inheritance that never fades. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, be with those who are ill at this time. And here we bring before you your servants, Norm Buker. We pray for the mother of Larry Mickelchuk, Joyce Mickelchuk, and the mother of Margaret Mickelchuk, Elsa Schmeling, all in the hospital, except for Norm. Thanks for watching, oh, thank you for watching over your servant Bill Schultz, now recovering at home, and all whom we now name in our hearts at this time. We pray also for all those who suffer, those troubled in mind, those grieving in their sorrows, and the dying in their last hours. Grant them the comfort of your presence, relief according to your mercy, and peace in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Holy and gracious God, we pray for the people of, the, of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for all those who are afraid, that your everlasting arms hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage that they are inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. Above all, Lord, today we pre pray for
for an end to the war and for peace for Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we bring before you the people of James Smith Cree Nation and the town of Weldon and for all who are affected by this tragedy. We mourn those who have died and pray for their loved ones. We pray for healing for all those who are injured. We pray for those who are re-traumatized by this violence. We pray for all those who are responding to the needs of these communities. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with all those who mourn, the members of the royal family, this nation and all nations of the commonwealth, that casting every care on you, we may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Father, you desire all to be saved. Remember your foes who forget your word and call them to repentance and faith, that they also would rejoice in your righteousness and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have forgiven our debt of sin for the sake of Jesus. Preserve us in his grace and life until that day when you gather us to be among the saints in glory around your throne. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father. Please stand. Receive now the benediction and blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in our closing song.
congregation may be seated. Thank you for being with us in worship this morning. Thank you to those who have taken the time to watch the video as well. I have several brief announcements that I'd like to make, but the rest are, and the rest will be in the bulletin. Just a reminder that our monthly luncheons resume again, and this month it's on the 22nd, and the Luminos um, chaplain will be here, past Chaplain Engel, to present um, what Luminos does and how they do those things. So we're asking you to make sure that you're signed up so that we can prepare the right amount of food and set up enough tables. Um, we invite you to read through the bulletin to find out more information about that. And there are a number of items in the bulletin that are new, including some information about the pictures that um, you've ordered from the picture company that did our photo directory. So there's informa updated information about when you will be receiving those and what the procedures are. All right, everything else you need to know is in the bulletin. Like I said, there are a number of new announcements. I just realized there's one more thing. We still have materials. Now, Mr. Chairman, the materials are available both in the side room here, the boardroom, and on the table in the photocopier. Is that correct? Okay, so please take a moment to go through this door and look at the materials on the tables in this room and in the photocopy room on the tables. Um, please take what you would like. We invite you to do so. All right, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask you to follow Ken Thurston out the door. Wait, there is one more announcement. Oh, yes, ha, wow. You, thank you for the reminder. So uh, we, we, last week, Eunice was gracious enough to play God Save the King at the end of, after, during the postlude. And I thought, what a good thing that is. So we didn't sing it last week, but we will be singing it today. And we're going to sing it, of course, with the updated words. Let's stand as we do that. And the reason we're not doing it during church is because I mentioned in the sermon that we are not citizens of any kingdom on earth, but it's good, right, and salutary for us to sing it today. Let's stand. Peace.